I want to talk today about AI strategy. So let's first talk about what is the potential impact of AI. I think we've seen numbers like this. Um, the one I sort of want to call attention to is maybe the last number or the last bullet, which is investors added more than $2 trillion to the market value of the five big tech companies, which you know, they believe is going to result in about three to four hundred billion dollars of additional revenues, which is essentially Apple's annual sales today. So I don't think any of us are disputing the value that AI is potentially going to bring to us. Having said that, now let's ask ourselves the question, is the impact of AI actually materializing? And I saw an interesting article from The Economist a couple weeks ago, and there were four charts on there that I wanted to share. So the first chart talks about the percentage of companies that are actually using artificial intelligence. And if you look at the bottom of the chart, you'll see that only 5% of companies have used AI over the last two weeks. And only about 6 to 7% of companies plan to use it in the next six months. I spoke to a few individuals and I asked them, are you willing to pay $30 or whatever the discounted price is for Microsoft Copilot? And most of them cringed. They said, we don't think we're going to pay $30 per user per month. Everyone loves the free tools, but a lot of people are not willing to pay the $30 a month. Let's talk about this next chart, which is, this is, so if you look at the top, um, graph in pink or salmon, whatever the color is, you'll see that the S&P 500 has gone up. Uh, it's gone up about 40% in the last four years. But companies that are supposed to be benefiting from AI, so companies like Walmart, H&R Block, that can use a lot of AI, their stock or that index, let's say, has not grown. So that's the bottom that you're seeing so there's a big discrepancy between companies that um, are on the S&P 500 and then companies that should actually be benefiting from the use of AI. Let's talk about the employment landscape. We are at employment levels. This is for white collar jobs. We are at employment levels that are higher than what we had at pre-COVID um, you know, at, you know, in pre-COVID days, let's say, right? So there hasn't really been much of an impact to employment, especially in white collar workers. And lastly, let's talk about productivity. So productivity hasn't gone up. Everyone felt that AI is going to drive more and more productivity, but it hasn't really happened. And I'll give you a personal example. I got caught up in the AI hype about a year ago, and I said, I'm going to invest in this ETF, put a little bit of money into it, and it hasn't done well. It's actually down about 6%. I'm thinking about taking my money out. So what's holding us back? What's going on? You know, do we have concerns about data security, biased algorithms, hallucinations? Uh, by the way, I love that term, hallucinations. Um, if someone didn't know that term and didn't work in the AI field, they would think that we're on LSD or something like that. Um, are we suffering from pilotitis? Um, you know, is there an issue with costs? Is there an issue with data? Do we have bad data? Do we, do we have issues with data quality? What's going on? And I want to just highlight an interesting example, um, and this was part of the Economist article as well. McDonald's recently released an AI tool to help with, with ordering um, you know, at its restaurants, at its fast food chains. And someone got a bill for $222 for ordering chicken nuggets, let alone $2 for chicken nuggets, $222, there's something going on there. So I want to talk a little bit about a story. I recently had um, someone come to me, you know, going to remain anonymous, and said, Raj, we want you to use 
generative AI to automate all of our emails, to send the best content out, to do micro-segmentation and micro-targeting. Does that sound familiar? You know, users come up to you and ask you for stuff like that. And I said, okay, hold on. Like, what's going on here? What's the business problem you're trying to solve? And they said, well, we need better engagement rates on our email marketing campaigns. So I said, okay, so you think better engagement rates are gonna be solved by sending micro-segmented, micro-targeted emails using generative AI. They're like, yeah, that's what's gonna solve the problem. I said, all right, let's talk about that for a second. And we did, and we dialogued. And you know what was happening? The emails were going out, but they were being caught by a spam filter, and they weren't getting to the recipients, so there was low engagement. So it wasn't micro-segmentation, it wasn't micro-targeting, it wasn't AI that was gonna solve that problem. We had not spent the time defining what the problem was. We should have said, oh, let's define the problem. The problem is the email's not getting there. The problem isn't that we need micro-segmentation and micro-targeting. So this brings me to what I personally think is my hypothesis on what's going on with AI. I'm an engineer, and I can say this. I often have been victim, or I have often fallen into the trap of looking for problems that these tools can solve. I have often focused on the how, and I have often been chasing those shiny objects, because who doesn't like to chase those shiny objects? And the pivot that I have been making for myself, for my team, for my organization has been around focusing on the why. Simon Sinek said this beautifully many years ago. He said, start with the why. Start with the business problem. So the core issue that I feel is going on is that too many organizations are focusing on the how to solve a problem not why a problem exists in the first place. And that goes back to the story I just shared about the email marketing tool. So this is, you know, when I think about an AI framework for success, when I think about an AI strategy for success, this is what I think about. And I think Ed from Genpact covered a lot of these points. So I'll quickly sort of walk us through this, which is, I think it starts first with organizational readiness. Do you have the right culture? Do you have executive sponsorship? Do you have the skills and do you have the talent? Then we got to take an inventory of, the, of, of our data. Do we have the right data? Is it accurate? Is it curated? Do we have the technology? And I don't need to spend more time on that. I think we understand that piece. Do we have the right partnership model? Do we have speedboats? that can help us. We're not gonna be able to do everything on our own, but do we have the right partnership model? Are we thinking about ethics and governance, misinformation, hallucinations? Are we, do we have the right training data sets? And do we have the right change management framework or policies or thinking in place? But what's more important is what's at the bottom of the slide, which is we need to articulate value and this is business value, we need to think about the problem statements and then measure whether we're actually able to solve those problem statements through the use of AI or whatever technology we wanna deploy and then rinse, repeat, and iterate. So that's how I think about sort of our AI framework. That's how I think about AI strategy. And I think it really starts with thinking about the why. So there's three things I wanna leave you with. It is focus on the why, not the how. Focus on value, and then deliver. Because in my opinion, delivery is the currency of credibility. So thank you. Um, I have worked with a friend of mine, Matt, to actually put this together. So if you ever need a free AI strategy session, reach out to Matt. Uh, he's part of the AI advisory group. And that's what I wanted to sort of share today. Thank you for your time.
Yes, Q&A, yep. While we have Raj, um, and we have a few minutes, do we have any questions? Would anyone like to ask a question? I can come to you with the mic for Raj. Yeah. Suzanne. <laughs> That was awesome, and uh, the re-emphasis on the importance of why. Awesome. Uh, where do you see people waste their time the most? Is it you know, just the what? Is it just the how? Is there something that people are overly fixated on? Yeah, I think there's a few things. I think, in my opinion, a lot of people are looking to spend a lot of time researching what technology exists that, you know, exists. Um, and it reminds me of a famous quote from Einstein, actually. Einstein once said, if I have an hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes actually solving it. I think we're doing the reverse. We're spending 55 minutes solving the problem and five minutes thinking about the problem. So I think we're spending a lot of time thinking about solutions, thinking about technology, thinking about, um, you know, Thinking about our data, which I would say is important, but, but I think unless you've articulated the problem, unless you understand why you want to solve that problem and what the business value of solving that problem is, I think the data, the technology, and all the other stuff is sort of secondary. So we just got to flip it, flip it, and I think we just got to spend more time thinking about the problem and really articulating what the problem is. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Hi. Uh, I have a question about hallucination. Sure. So... People who are on LSD and hallucinating, for the most part, they are lucid. Right? Sorry, I, I can you so say yeah. people who are on LSD and they are hallucinating, when they are not on LSD, they are lucid. Their right. brain is actually working. Okay. So there is a distinction. There's a phase transition from this person makes sense most of the time, yeah. and when they are on LSD, they are, you know, high and and more creative. Sure. Gen AI, on the other hand, does not have that concept. There is no, there is no line. There is no phase transition. It is always hallucinating. Hallucination is by design. I see. So, does it even make sense to talk about uh, how to solve for hallucination or how to cure hallucination and so on and so forth? Does, is hallucination even the right word? Yeah, look, I don't know what the right word is. Um, I have never taken LSD in my life and I don't plan to. So. Um, I can't relate to what happens when you take LSD or you don't, um, but I'm not sure, in my opinion, I'm not sure hallucinations is the right word. I think for me it's more about accuracy. And I think, um, you know, to your point, the LLM model is going to be inaccurate in certain cases, and I think we have to think about when is it inaccurate, why is it inaccurate, and I think we have to do the due diligence around when it produces some content, I think we have to go back and put the right governance structures in place to make sure that we can validate that that content is appropriate uh, before it's used, um, you know, further for whatever use case we're thinking about. So, uh, you know, I you know I think about hallucinations more as sort of accuracy and a measure of accuracy. So accuracy is a good word, but I, I want to draw a finer point there. It makes sense to talk about accuracy if. Um, the, the person that you're talking about or the machine that you're describing cares about the truth. You can draw a line between this is truthful and this is a lie if, you know, there is a concept of truth. With, yep. with LLMs, there's just a concept of generation. Yep. So it just makes stuff up because it's, it's designed to make stuff up. So is, is truth even a thing in, in the world of LLMs? That's, that's my broader question. And it's probably more philosophical than technological at this point, but that's, uh, that's where I'm going with that. No, I think it's a fair point. Look, I think we, we live in a world of a lot of disinformation these days. So to your point, um, what is truth and what is not um, is a debate in and of itself. And, uh, you know, I personally um, use data to define truth. But I also know that data can be twisted in many ways. Um, so... It's a great question. I don't have a good answer for you because, um, you know, the definition of truth versus what is not truth gets to be extremely philosophical. But thank you for raising that. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, great present. Great. Thank content. you. Um, 
the question of why so i'm looking at the days from when data science was sexy and you came into ai now becomes gen ai isn't that question of why was always there that's what we are trying to solve from the time when we have data scientists machine learning to gen ai as well that part did not should not have changed right so as a ai leaders as a machine learning community why we have not focused on why for so many years and why we are talking about it now yeah i think my my hypothesis to that question is uh, and I can say this because I'm an engineer. Engineers love to solve problems, even if they're solving the wrong problem. Um, and this is not an offense to any engineers. I say that as an engineer myself. So I think you know, what we've often struggled with is we've often struggled to connect a lot of these solutions to real world problems. Um, and I think we're starting to talk more and more about making that linkage and making that shift. And I think the more and more of those conversations we have, the more we can actually connect some of these solutions to real world problems and business problems that are gonna deliver value. I think there's also, a, you know, at least to some of the companies that I've worked for, there's a strong push from executive management, from the CEOs that say, don't talk to me about AI, talk to me about what value can AI bring to my organization. And I think that question is now fueling us to really think about the why as opposed to the how. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so question on the pilotitis, you mentioned pilotitis there and obviously it's, it's been going on for yeah. five, six, seven years. Yep. Does it kind of go back to again the focus on uh, 95% time on solution and why is it is it the reason why the pilotitis has been kind of going on in this for such a long time compared to you know other concepts like big data and uh, you know other trends that you had over years yeah so i think pilotitis has been in my opinion been going on because i think many of us want to play with these technologies um, you know i think it's like it's like a kid in a candy store. You want to try the candy a little bit. And, um, you know, and we know that that candy might not be good for us uh, or you know, a lot of that candy might not be good for us. So you know, I think we're, we're, just following, we're just falling victim to being the kid in the candy store as, you know, as opposed to asking ourselves, is this a candy store that we really need to enter? Is this good for us? Is this going to deliver some value for us? So look, I think um, it's the shiny object syndrome, right? I think we like, to, we like to play around with things that are cool, that are sexy. I mean, uh, you know, we all wanna drive the best, you know, the newest car that's out there that has the greatest technology because we love technology, right? But I think if technology is not connected to solving for a business problem, in my opinion, it's, it's useless technology. So, yeah, I think it's it's human nature. I think it's you know which which kid doesn't want to go into a candy store, right? I mean, we all fall victim to it. I had a question here. Should we think of AI as a tool uh, or something else? Because we think software, we think engineering, but if you think about the evolution of AI, the word GPT and Chat is going to be dropped by OpenAI next year. They're bringing out five towards mm -hmm. the end of next year, and they will be called reason, uh, reasoners. Yeah. And then there is an evolutionary pathway, which mm -hmm. is going to hit us by 2030 and beyond. Um, I mean, to you and to all the leaders in the room, as we are thinking about AI strategy, if we take the mindset of another tool that we need to govern and manage with traditional methodologies versus something completely different, and how we partner with that is probably something that we need to bake into our uh, strategic thinking. Just wanted your reaction. Yeah, I, you know, I think for me, defining AI as a tool is maybe too narrow of a definition. I think of AI as an enabler. I think of AI as an accelerator uh, when applied to the right business problem. So, you know, that for me means AI can be a tool, but it could also be, um, you know, I think if you think of AI as an enabler, you have to think of it in the context of process. You have to think of it in the context of data and governance and providing intelligence to your organization, right? So for me, it's a little bit broader of a, de of a definition. I think of AI as an enabler. I think 
the tooling aspect of it is one part of it, I would say, but AI can do more than just being thought about as a tool. I think it's got much more larger potential than just a tool, in my opinion.